Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for joining. Today is December 7th in the US and December 8th in Perth. So I'm um, getting back on with my lives and thank you everyone uh, for joining in. Hopefully, hopefully we get your questions answered in uh, a reasonable way. Okay, let's see here. Um, just trying to get some, there's already been a couple super chats that have popped up. Let's just pop this up here. It's a question from Vince. Thank you very much for the super chat, Vince. 31 year old male have always been more cold than average males throughout adulthood. I get really cold, especially in the limbs on keto for two years and now carnivore for 56 days gets better after eating how to fix this. Tried iodine even worse. Not sure. Well, it's not necessarily an iodine issue, but you could have a thyroid issue. That's not necessarily uh, the cause, but I mean, it is one of the symptoms when you have have thyroid dysfunction, either low or high thyroid, you can get either cold and sensitive or hot and sensitive. You can get different sorts of temperature and sensitivities depending on which direction it goes. So uh, it might be worth checking out. Uh, check your TSH, your free T4 and your free T3. Um, at the very least, and uh, get those checked out. If you want to go deeper in, you can check your reverse T3, which is sort of there's there's a lot of layers of complexity to testing the thyroid. A lot of doctors will just stop at the TSH, but that's not always good enough because you have T you have T0, T1, T2, T3, and T4. Often, if your T4 is high enough, your TSH will be in a normal range. But some people don't convert T4 into T3, which is really the active form of, of thyroid hormone. And so um, you can have issues with that, or you get down to the reverse T3 that um, is showing how active, um, biologically active that, that thyroid hormone is in the cells. That's where they work, right? So even if you have enough serum thyroid hormone, it may not be enough to get the, um, the action in the cells that you need, but your TSH might be normal, your T3 might be normal, your T4 might be normal. Um, so, uh, there's sort of levels of complexity. So if you feel that you're having symptoms, you know, do see your doctor and because, you know, cold and sensitivity, you know, is, is, you know, one symptom that, that could be at play, but there are, are many more that would, um, that would, that could tip you off to a thyroid dysfunction. Then you just check the thyroid. Um, also the reference ranges for these things are not great because the reference ranges are from the lab and the lab is just looking at the average for the community. Most people in the community are metabolically unwell or, and, or overweight. And so, you know, you can't, you can't really trust that. That's not something to go by. You're not trying to compare yourself to the average person because the average person is sick. It used to be the average person was well and healthy. Now that is not the case. So it's not, it's not reliable. It's not a good, good metric. So, um, TSH, generally want it lower than um, than their upper range for most reference ranges. But you can talk to a doctor that understands that and uh, and see where you fall in that. And, um, and then check the other sort of thyroid things as well. So the other thing you need to consider is that if you do have thyroid dysfunction, such as, and, and depending on what it's, it's going to be caused by something. And so if it's caused by, say, Hashimoto's disease, Taking iodine can exacerbate Hashimoto's disease. So you need to, you need to know, and you need to know if you even have a, an iodine deficiency because you may not. So I don't I don't think it's a good idea to blindly take supplements. I think it's important to test. Um, it's best to get your nutrition from your diet. But if for some reason you know the food that we're eating is you know food we're not eating you know uh, wild caught woolly mammoths and things like that anymore. So the the food that we're eating isn't as healthy as it used to be, and because the ground soil isn't as, as healthy as it used to be, and so the animals aren't eating grass that's as, or or you know foliage that's as healthy as it used to be, and so they don't necessarily have all the nutrients, especially if if they're not wild. So. It's um it's important to check your your numbers and if your iodine is perfectly fine, well then you don't need to take iodine, right? Iodine is generally pretty safe to supplement with. However, if you have Hashimoto's disease, it's not, and that can actually make things a lot worse. So you want to check those things. If your thyroid is a bit off, check your thyroid uh, antibodies for Hashimoto's. If you have any 
then that means you have it. You know, they say, well, well if it's below this range, it's okay. No, it's not. Um, if you have antibodies towards your body, then you have an autoimmune disease. It may be subtle at the moment. It may not be very active, but it's there. And so you need to be aware of that. And so if you have any antibodies towards Hashimoto's, then you have Hashimoto's thyroiditis and taking iodine is a bad idea. So that's what I would do. I would just check your thyroid, check your iodine and check your levels and, uh, and then, you know, adjust as needed. You may not need to take iodine. If you're, if you're getting more symptomatic with iodine, you, you almost certainly don't need to take iodine. Okay. Super chat from Sephiroth Cloud saying, thanks so much for the super chat. Cooked meat, max time out of fridge if I cook it again. Um, well, I don't know if you need to cook it again, maybe like reheat it or something like that. Uh, might be a good idea. It well, it, look, it depends. You know, I mean, if you if you're in in a household uh, and you've got flies and things like that, you know, I mean, you don't want to leave it out uncovered. You know, flies are going to get on there. They're going to lay eggs, and you're going to get maggots and things like that. It's just you don't want that. Um, I've left cooked meat out for you know a while. Um, I I don't you know have flies in my house and um, generally, and so you know sometimes I'd, I'd cook a brisket and leave it on the counter and just just cut off slabs as I go and I might eat that over a week completely unrefrigerated you know there's a bit of a risk you know uh, with if, if things are getting on it and introducing bacteria but sort of the way I think about it is um, you've just you've just sterilized this thing I mean I've, I've cooked that brisket longer and at a higher temperature um, or longer and, and, you know, at a, at a similar temperature than we, than we do when we autoclaving, you know, surgical equipment, you know, we're sterilizing those things. So, um, things should be sterile, you know, when it comes out and, you know, if you, you're going to be introducing bacteria and there's going to be bacteria in the environment. So that's going to get on there. So you need to, you need to be, um, you know, aware of that and you need to pay attention, you know, because you don't want to get contamination. You don't want to get food poisoning. You don't want to get bacteria in there. And if you see visible signs of that, or is there smell or something like that, then obviously you need to not eat that. Um, it can be more subtle than that. And you may not even notice it. So that that's the thing. I do that because I'm, you know, I found that's okay, but you know, other people could run into trouble. So it is a good idea to refrigerate these things, you know, leaving it out for a few hours or even overnight, as long as things aren't, you know, touching it and fiddling with it and you don't flies on it, it's probably okay. But, you know, use, use your judgment on that. Uh, Shotgunette, thank you so much for the super chat. I went to 130 pounds at five foot six and am now uh, insatiable. Cannot eat enough and not be anxious. Cannot eat enough to not be anxious. Sorry. Um, but I'm also gaining weight carnivore plus ferments, uh, what to do? Well, I'm assuming that you're gaining weight and you don't want to gain weight. It would matter what kind of weight that you're gaining. Are you gaining muscle? Or are you putting on fat? Um, that's very important. And so just because you're gaining weight doesn't mean that you're necessarily putting on bad weight, right? So, um, you know, you can get a, body fat calculator, you can get a DEXA scan, you can do a body composition scan, you can sort of see what's going on because if you're putting on bone density and muscle mass, well, that's a good thing. And and so how much you weigh on the scale isn't necessarily um, a problem. Insatiability, that could be from a couple of things. Maybe, you know, sometimes it's when, when people are underweight in the sense that their body wants them heavier than they are. They want more uh, lean body mass, maybe even a bit more body fat to put on. Depends on where you're coming from. If you were a bit underweight, then your body's going to want to naturally do that. Um, and you're going to be a lot hungrier, especially if you haven't been eating enough or haven't been getting enough nutrients, uh, for a long time. Um, and so, you know, you want to, um, you know, you want to, you want to, you know, make sure that, well, you, you, want, you just want to see. I mean, your body sometimes will want to put on a bit of fat, and so it'll want to put on a bit a bit more tissue. Um, and so you can be very hungry because of that, and your body's just stacking up nutrients. I think there's another comment down here saying, most definitely, it's definitely fat, just a little bit. I'm getting extra fat in the form of butter, 
but losing my hourglass a bit. Um, okay, so so another thing, it looks like you're getting a bit of fat uh, on the butter, but from the butter, but also, you know, when people eat, uh, you know, a lot of protein in comparison to the amount of grams of fat that they're getting, you can get, you can get quite insatiable from that. It's something called rabbit starvation, where people were eating rabbits that had almost no fat on them and they couldn't just stop eating. They couldn't satisfy their hunger. They're just eating more and more and more and more and more. And then eventually they died. You know, their bo your body chases nutrients. It doesn't chase calories. And so, Fat is an essential nutrient. It has essential fatty acids that you have to have. You can't get it from any other source, and you don't really make them very well yourself. So you have to have them. And then there are essential um, vitamins and minerals that only come in the fat as well, the fat soluble vitamins, right? So these things only come in animal fat. They don't come in you know plant oil, certainly, and we don't make them. And so that's how you have to get them. And so your body's looking, is chasing nutrients. And so sometimes when people gain weight, um, it can be a problem with, with that, that, um, or especially when they're in, you know, just ravenously hungry. Um, the other thing, you know, is, is from ferments that you're eating. Um, well, so you're saying you're eating meat and you're eating ferments. Are you eating anything else, any sort of artificial sweetener, any stevia, monk fruit sugar, anything like that? Um, dairy, dairy can be a big weight loss stall for people, or they can put on weight. Um, if you're having fermented yogurt, I would most definitely just keep it to like a small spoonful on one piece of meat and you chew it up, you chew it together, you swallow it whole, and that's it. You're not eating a whole bucket of yogurt, right? You're just a little bit every day. And, and in fact, I don't do that often. It's, it would only be like if I were you know, if I needed antibiotics or something like that, you know, the, you know, the once or twice that's, that's happened or something like that in the last decade, you know, so I would take, I would do that. Um, but once you've established your microbiome, you don't need to keep reseeding it. You, it just maintains because it's, it's eating what you're eating. And if you're eating the right thing, you're going to maintain the right bacteria. And so, you know, you don't need to do that. Um, it may be that you're eating, you know, a lot of different fermented plants and things like that. Again, if you're going to do that, I would keep it to a bare minimum, just a little tiny bit with a bite of meat, chew it up together and take that down sort of as, as a supplement to your microbiome. And again, you don't have to keep, I don't think you have to keep doing that your whole life. And um, you know, for the simple fact that the Inuit don't, and um, they're just eating meat and they have extremely healthy microbiome. So presumably once you have an established microbiome, uh, that's that's favorable. Eating meat will just perpetuate that. Um, it may be that you don't have a favorable microbiome, and so you need the fermented um, uh, food products, uh, animal or vegetable, to uh, to get you there. But I think once you have it there, I, I think it's okay. Um, so that's what I would do. I would I would make sure you're getting enough fat, at least one gram of fat per one gram of Protein, if not up to two grams of fat to one gram of protein, Food, fat is very satiating as well. And and sometimes people gain weight or they don't lose weight properly because they're not eating enough fat. You're adding in butter, uh, which is good, but that may not be enough. Uh, see how you go. Um, make sure you're only eating fatty meat and water. Ferments, keep them to a minimum. And I, I don't think you necessarily need to do it forever. And then just cut out absolutely everything else. And you know, and also remember that um, that our body wants to put on a bit of weight, possibly. You know, if we're if our body feels that we're a bit underweight, you know, saying that you're losing your sort of hourglass figure. You know, I, I understand that is a bit concerning. Um, so it could be that there are some of these other things, maybe you know, dairy or uh, not eating enough fat is actually what's the problem here, as opposed to your body just wants you to be a bit more uh, have, carry a bit more weight. So I, I would try these sorts of things. And, and that's, that's what we do. We just troubleshoot things. You just go down the list of probabilities and you just try to refine these things down. You know, if you're doing anything else except fatty meat and water, stop and, uh, and make sure you're eating enough, make sure you're eating enough fat. Those are all very important. And you just go down the list. And if there's still a problem, then we, we take a look at it. Sometimes people just need to heal and their body takes a bit of an adjustment, sort of goes up and it goes down and goes up and it goes down and then it stabilizes. So see how you go. So super chat from Jack Coleman. Thank you very much uh, for that. Doesn't look like there's a question attached, but possibly down the road. Um, cheesy Chunky, same thing. Thank you very much for the super chat. We'll see if 
there's something down down the line um, as well. That's the thing too, guys. If if your question doesn't get through when you do a super chat, please put that in just the normal chat, and we'll try to grab it and find it and still answer it. Um, okay, so here's here's one from Jack Coleman. Thank you again for the for the super chat. You don't need to do a second super chat, guys. Just just put that in the comments. Um, I mean, obviously, it's easier to see if it's a super chat, but if it's uh, but, you don't, but we're going to try to find. I have a, a friend of mine, Melissa, helping me with with this. So you know, trying to track those down. Um, so you don't need to you don't need to you know do two super chats. So Jack says, been on carnivore for five months. Um, sometimes I go through, uh, periods of not eating, um, no for days or for a number of days, maybe no appetite, sometimes three to four days. Is this normal? If so, why? So look, it's very normal to under eat. It's very common to under eat on a carnivore diet because you're just not going to feel as hungry as you, as you used to. So your, your, your hunger signals change dramatically on a, on a carnivore diet or even a ketogenic diet um, because you're getting rid of, of sugar and you're getting rid of carbs and that's going to lower your insulin. Insulin is a fat storage hormone. So first of all, that puts you in a fat, uh, fat storage metabolism as opposed to a fat burning metabolism, but it also slows down your metabolism. And it also blocks a hormone called leptin, which is a satiety hormone. So you're blocking your satiety hormone so you don't get satiated as much. You overeat. And it's more complex than that. But I, I talk about this in a lot of videos, so I won't get, get into that here. But um, suffice it to say that that it uh, it changes your satiety signal. So normally when you're eating carbohydrates, you're eating a bunch of plants that can mimic insulin. These different lectins can bind onto the insulin receptors five times more tightly than insulin does and also block leptin. Um, this makes it so you don't get satiated. Your body thinks you're starving all the time. And so you just, it's just telling you eat, 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 eat. And as what you eat, you know, 4,000 calories and your know, pancakes and syrup in the morning. And, you know, by lunchtime, you're like, oh my God, I'm starving. Why are you starving? You're not starving. Of course, you're not starving. You have plenty of energy in you. Um, even very slender people have weeks of energy available to them, uh, even if they didn't eat at all. Um, even before they started, you know, catabolizing their, their muscle tissue. So we, you know, that's not, you're not starving. And so that signal that, oh my God, I'm starving is wrong. Okay. That's a, that's a pathological signal that you're getting because you've deranged your hormones and you've deranged your body's natural signals. Um, so you overeat. And so now you get rid of that, you get rid of the carbs, you get rid of the insulin, you lower down the insulin down to normal levels. And what do you know? You're not hungry anymore because we associate that starvation signal with hunger. That's just how that's normal hunger because that's always been normal for us. It's not normal. It's, it's not, it's absolutely not normal. So you need to relearn your hunger signals. They're going to be much more subtle. And so you need to think, well, I'm a little tired or a little this or a little that. And you're like, hmm. Okay, does that mean I'm hungry? Or I'm getting car you're getting carb cravings or sugar cravings. You have to think to yourself, okay, does this mean I'm hungry? Try eating meat. If it tastes good, yes, you are. Go by taste. So if fatty meat tastes good, yes, you are hungry. Keep eating until fatty meat stops tasting good because that's when you know your body doesn't want it anymore. Because again, your body chases nutrients, it doesn't chase calories. We have receptors in our stomach that track up to our brain that actually look for nutrients. And so this is why that that idea that started back in the 80s, it said, you know, if you want to lose weight, just eat a whole bunch of vegetables, or high fiber vegetables, because, you know, they don't have, um, you know, they, they don't have any nutrition, they don't have very many calories. And so but they have bulk. And so they'll fill up your stomach, they'll release leptin, right? So it releases from your stretch receptors in your stomach, most of it's re released from your fat stores. But something is released from your stretch receptors, and they say, "Oh, you, and your brain will get satiated because of the leptin, right?" Well, that's not that never worked, and so people are eating a whole bunch of big salads and vegetables and this like that, and they're just starving all the time. They're bloated and miserable, and have gut pain, and they're hungry, you know. And so it's it's actually not useful because it doesn't. The stretch receptor is only one part of a much bigger issue. Also, you you stretch out your stomach, you release some leptin. But your insulin's up, so it's blocking that. It's blocking the rest of your leptin as well, and your stomach is looking for actual nutrients which are not there. And so your brain isn't stupid. It's certainly not as stupid as those people that make that recommendation. Um, and so, 
you know, it's, um, you know, they, they, I mean, they were saying this at the time, you know, they were like, oh, well, you know, it's, it just tricks your body into thinking um, that that you've actually eaten and there's actual food there. And um, you trick your body into thinking that 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 there's something there and, and you know, silly body, you know, there, there's no actual nutrients, there's no actual calories there. You didn't trick a thing, you know, our, our bodies are much smarter than that. And so uh, that's the thing. So you need to relearn your hunger signals. Uh, yeah, four days generally too much, right? I, I look, it's like the Mongols. I think it's gone the Mongol horde. I mean, they would, you know, they'd go five days, you know, ravaging the countryside without eating, and and uh, but then they'd eat ten pounds of horse meat, and then they go do it again, right? So, so you know, predators, apex predators, certainly um, big predators they're used to not getting, um, you know, a big meal every single day. So we're, we're established for that biologically, but you know, you need to get a, you need to get enough when you eat. That's why you keep eating fatty meat until it stops tasting good. Right. And so, you know, if you're only eating every few days, um, but you're doing that and you're eating enough, fine, you know, worked for, you know, the, the Mongol empire, which is the largest contiguous empire that has ever existed on this planet. So, um, you know, and they were doing that for hundreds of years. Right. Um, so it's not, uh, it's not a big deal to, or it's not, you know, the end of the world, if you're not eating more than once every three or four days, if you are eating to, you know, your maximum capacity when you do eat. Right. But most likely what's happening here is that you're not doing that and you're not getting enough and you are, and you're just going by, you're basing on your, your hunger signals based on what you used to feel, uh, when you, you would be hungry and, uh, that's very different. So I did this when I first started doing, uh, all, stopped eating all plants and was only eating meat 23 years ago, going on 24 years ago, Jesus. And, um, <laughs> And uh, I, I wasn't eating for three, four days at a time. And I was like, this is weird, but I just, I'm just not hungry. I'm just not hungry, but it was affecting me because I got to the point where I just, I'd run out of stores. And, um, and the more I worked out, the worse I felt. It was really strange. And so I was just like, okay, what the hell is happening? It must be, I'm just not eating up because I'm not eating enough, but I'm just not hungry. It's like, okay, it doesn't matter. I need to eat, you know? And so you just eat. So try eating once a day. Try eating fatty meat once a day. If it tastes good, you are hungry. Keep eating until it stops tasting good. Okay? If you are going, you're like, that sounds awful. A steak sounds awful. A steak should never sound awful. A steak is amazing. And so if, if a steak doesn't taste good, you're not hungry. It's okay. Don't eat. Even if that means you don't eat that day. Just wait. The next day, it's going to taste good. Okay? Uh, I would I would doubt that you'll get to three, four days of just like, ugh, I don't want it. I don't want it. I want it. It might happen. Um, there's sometimes you get meat aversion, food aversion during pregnancy. Um, doc, my friend, Dr. Kiltz, uh, who's a fertility specialist, OBGYN, um, in New York, he, uh, he, you know, he sees this and he thinks that that's just the body telling you, you know, to fast. So, um, Dr. Fecky thinks the same thing. So, you know, uh, listen to your body, but you need to know what your body's saying. You need to relearn the signal. So, Right now, you don't know your body's signals. So you're trying to listen to your body, but you may not be getting the message. So you need to relearn your hunger signals. Try eating once a day, fatty meat. If it tastes good, keep eating until it doesn't taste good. You'll relearn. It'll 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 make sense to your body uh, after a while. And um, yeah, good luck with that. But yeah, do try eating once a day. If it doesn't taste good, it doesn't taste good. You don't have to eat. It's fine. Put it in the fridge. It'll be there tomorrow. It will taste better the next day. Trust me. Ragnar uh, Odinson, sick ass name. That's great. So, um, uh, thank you for the super chat. Um, any reports of wintergreen uh, ZYN nicotine pouches tricking the body into an insulin response? Been using them uh, to get off of vape. Um, I, I don't know about an insulin response, you know, I mean, it, it is generally considered that, that nicotine helps suppress hunger signals. Um, 
I don't know about the insulin response. Like if there's, you know, it's a flavored thing, right? So it's, um, you know, if it's got artificial sweeteners and things like that, um, it could trigger insulin. Um, there are mixed reports on that in the literature, but I've, I've seen people that take uh, artificial sweeteners and, and drinks and things like that. And it absolutely screws with their blood sugar. And, um, and so, you know, it's, you know, and, and in fact, there's also, you know, in the literature, um, cases of reactive hypoglycemia, meaning that, you know, you take in this artificial sweetener, your body thinks you're getting sugar, you kick out some insulin, but there's no sugar there. So your blood sugar drops. You can do that with sugar as well. If your blood sugar goes up, your insulin goes up, but then insulin stays up and then the blood sugar goes down too low. So that's called reactive hypoglycemia. Um, I don't know specifically about that, but you know, could potentially do that if it has a lot of sweeteners um, because you just get that sweet taste in your mouth and then that goes to your brain. Oh no, there's sugar coming down and that can trigger you, your body to start making insulin doesn't necessarily always release it. There's so much, there's so much, so much we don't know about the body. We sort of glean information, you know, from various studies, but there's a lot of conflicting information. The main thing is just, you know, see what happens to your body because that's what matters. You know, we use studies to make decisions in our own life and to, to try to make a decision more confidently, but it doesn't matter what the study says. If you do that thing and you get a the opposite outcome that you were expecting or that the study told you you were going to get or or that you wanted to get don't do it right like it's just not it doesn't matter what the study says what matters is what happens in real life right i mean just i mean it's just so stupid i mean we don't know that's what the study says oh i have a study that says if i shoot myself in the face with a shotgun nothing's going to happen i'll get candy you know well, okay well that's dumb you're dumb you know, like, because you can see with your own damn eyes that something else happens, that you don't get candy, that people are very hurt and die, right? So, you know, that's dumb. It doesn't, obviously, there's no study that says that, but, you know, it, it, we get that to that level of stupidity because you have it. Oh, there's a study that says that. Okay. Well, when you do it in real life, the exact opposite things, oh, but there's a study. Who gives a shit, right? It's, it doesn't matter, right? Um, studies are trying to glean information, um, describing real life, but if it disagrees with real life, then it's a bad study and there's something wrong with it. Right. And so this is why I used often and, and still, you know, tout the quote from, uh, the physicist, Richard Feynman, who said, it doesn't matter how brilliant your theory is. And it doesn't matter how smart you are. If it doesn't agree with experiment, it's wrong. Right. So, you know, you have all these people that just, just, just are so beholden on studies. And yes, studies are great. They can give you a lot of good information, but they're just, oh, study, study, study. And then you know, people go out in the real world and get the exact opposite response. Like people say, oh, well, there's a study that says eating more meat is bad. And yet you have millions of people around the world only eating meat and their health improves. So it's dumb. It's a dumb study and you're dumb for listening to it. So uh, it just matters what happens to your body. So if you feel that you're getting some sort of insulin response, if you feel that that's messing with your blood sugar, if you feel that that's screwing with you in some way, just cut it out. You can get nicotine patches. They're not going to have any of that problem. You'll still get the nicotine. Um, also remember that getting off of nicotine um, takes about two weeks. Generally, the, the chemical dependency takes about two weeks. So it's it's rough at first, but it gets a little better. And you know, every day gets a little better, a little better, a little better. And then after two weeks, the chemical dependency should be gone. And then it's just the habit. You know, you liked doing it. You enjoyed that feeling and sensation. It was calming. It was relaxing. You're stressed out, and you that's your go-to. Takes about four to six weeks to retrain your body into new habits. So, you know, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. You can just sort of you know keep track of this. Okay, two weeks. Okay, I'm not dependent anymore, and I'm well on the way to making new habits right? Then another couple of weeks and then you have new habits. So it's not as bad as all that. You know, it doesn't take 20 years before these cravings go away. It's, it's weeks. Okay. So at some point, you know, you can, yeah, you can wean yourself down, wean yourself down and then wean yourself off. You can do that. Um, studies in addiction generally show that, um, cold Turkey works best. At some point you have to go to cold Turkey, right? At some point you are going to stop right? You're going to wean down to a level and then stop. 
the withdrawals aren't as bad at that point, fine. But the withdrawals go away no matter what. You know, there are certain things that that are not safe to just come off if you are truly addicted, like alcohol, like um, benzodiazepines. You can get seizures. You can die. Most other things don't fall into that category. So just remember, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. You can just stop right now and you will likely have a have a miserable week or two and uh, and then it'll be gone right eating a lot of fatty meat eating a lot of uh, you know carnivore sort of things actually can help with addiction this has been shown in clinical trials with alcoholism that coming off of alcohol when they were they needed to do this with with you know in a hospital setting because there were but you know there's the potential for them to get seizures and and dts um that they found that the group that was on a ketogenic diet at the time um felt better it was easier for them to come off it was either easier for them to stay off and they needed less medications to stop seizures right so that's an objective improvement right so it's actually changing and improving the brain chemistry and so you know i don't know of any studies to do that with with nicotine but you know you're at least going to be giving yourself proper nutrition and your brain and your body are going to at least be optimized in that sense as well so you know at some point you just you know you can you can come off and that's the timeline there is a light at the end of the tunnel if it's not as bad as all that if you can get yourself through that you should be good single barrel thank you very much for the super chat and just so you know guys i've got probably 45 minutes um left uh, and then i got to go to work and uh but so we'll get through as many of these as we can uh single barrel uh thank you for the super chat should i be limiting the amount of bone marrow i eat uh, like liver, or is it less problematic in terms of frequency and amount? I find that I enjoy. Uh, no, no, I don't. I don't think there's. I, I don't know of any reason to limit bone marrow. I think you should be fine on that. Um, if someone does, like, if there's like certain fat soluble vitamins, you know, I mean, the issue with vitamin or with issue with with liver, you can get too much vitamin A, you can get too much copper. Most people are like deficient in copper anyway, so um, it, it's it's going to take a while before you you get up to a problem state, but it happens. Um, but not that I know of, I think, I think marrow's, marrow's pretty good. Aiken, thank you very much for the super chat. I've been following carnivore for three months um, and lost and lost weight. I saw a review that concluded the Inuit did have lower life expectancy and heart disease. Canadian Journal of Cardiology, I'm concerned. Um, it depends on when you look at it, right? So uh, there's two questions there. It's life expectancy and heart disease. So if you, I mean, you look back through the literature of the last 120 years, at the beginning of the last century, at the beginning of the 20th century, next to no heart disease, if any, especially, and, and, you, and you have to differentiate out between the Inuit population ethnically and those in the Inuit population who are still living a traditional life and only eating meat and not eating junk food. Most of them are eating junk food now. And so this, these are very dishonest people doing dishonest work and dishonest people like Simon Hill use these things and that, you know, that Nagra, Matt Nagra, they're, they're very dishonest people. And they use these, they use these studies dishonestly. They look for the most recent studies that that look at the Inuit as an ethnic population, as an ethnic group, as opposed to people eating a carnivore diet, right? So those are very two different things, right? I, I don't I don't care about the people that are living in cities drinking alcohol and and eating a whole bunch of junk food, or the people living out in the wilderness drinking alcohol and eating junk food. That's not what we're talking about, are we? We're talking about people eating only meat. And so when you look at the people that only eat meat, they're actually much, much, much more healthy. Also, the Inuit population as a whole starts smoking on average at eight years old, right? Smoking is definitely a risk for heart disease, okay? So when you look at earlier in the century, earlier in the 20th century, very low, very low heart disease rates as a population, not even just the ones eating a pro proper diet, the ones eating a proper meat only diet, none, right? You get on and on and on in the 20th century when they're becoming more and more involved in Western society and eating more and more Western food, drinking more and more Western alcohol, and they're getting more and more heart disease, still lower than the rest of Canada. As far as the 1990s, uh, 1996, there was a study that came out of Canada um, or studying 
studying the Inuits in Canada. And, and at, even in 1996, the entire body and population of Inuits had much lower rates of heart disease than uh, the general Canadian population. Okay. And they, um, and they, so they were thinking, well, maybe they have special genetic adaptations, you know, to, uh, to, to weather these, this horrible lifestyle that they have of eating a whole bunch of fatty meat. And they found, no, they have basically every genetic risk factor and marker, um, you know, for, uh, for heart disease. And so they're like, okay, well, we have no idea what the hell's going on then. You know, maybe there's something else going on. Maybe, um, these genetic markers aren't as cracked up, you know, uh, as, as we thought they were. Um, and so, you know, that was 1996. And so, you know, wow, Canadian Journal of Cardiology in 2020 or something like that says that, oh, heart disease rates are higher. Yeah, no shit. Because the thing is, is that when eating a Western diet, they are four times as likely to get heart disease and cancer and all these sorts of things. Um, you know, uh, Wilhelmer Stefansson is a professor of ethnology at Harvard, and he was a, a polar explorer and lived with the Inuits for 12 years, learned their language and their culture. And, um, you know, he wrote a book called Fat of the Land. He's like, these guys don't just don't get disease. I've never been healthier in my life than eating just a meat only diet with a lot of fat. And, uh, and he wrote another book called, you know, is cancer a disease of civilization because these guys just weren't getting cancer. But again, you look, you look at the literature throughout the 20th century and like the cancer rates are very low, if not non-existent early on. And then just decade by decade, it slowly increases and slowly increases and slowly increases. That's why, because they're eating Western food. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of conflation there. You know, you take a study looking at people who have a higher genetic risk factor for heart disease when eating a Western diet, which causes heart disease flat out. Um, and, and they start smoking when they're eight years old. And you're looking at the population and you don't differentiate between the ones that are only eating meat and the ones that are eating a whole bunch of high octane crap. And you're saying, oh, well, look at them. Oh, they get more heart disease. No kidding. They're genetically susceptible to getting heart disease. And I'm arguing that the food is causing the heart disease, right? So that proves my point because the people that are only eating meat don't get the heart disease. The ones eating a Western diet get the heart disease, right? So, um, so that's first of all. Second of all, life expectancy. Life expectancy uh, is measured on, on an average from birth. Now they are. It used to be measured more responsibly. They used to measure life expectancy every decade. So from zero, that was, you know, people would live on average a certain amount of time. When you are living out in the wild and you're living out in the country and you're living out with polar bears and things like that and horrible, horribly harsh Arctic environments, child infant mortality rate is actually pretty high. You know, childbirth death is high, you know, labor, if you're not at a hospital and you have a complication in childbirth, mom's dead, baby's dead. That lowers life expectancy significantly as a population. That does not tell you anything about how old people are when they die of old age. So if you look at the statistics and Bureau of Statistics in the U.S. have these, at least for the U.S., and every country will have these, it goes by decade. So at age zero, your average life expectancy from birth is X. When you get up to 10, it's X plus whatever. You know, it goes up. So even in 1850s in America, the average life expectancy from birth in 1850 was, I think, 36, 36 or 38, right? So this is where people get all oh, people were dying in their 30s. No, they weren't, you dumb bastard. That is average from birth. And the infant mortality rate was like two or three out of five at the time. So most kids are dying, you know, or a lot of kids are dying, you know, in infancy. That brings down that average significantly. Other people are going to have to live a lot longer to bring that average up even to 36 or 38, right? And so you look at the at 10 year olds, average life expectancy from 10 years old is something like 60 years old. So it's a big jump right? Like that, right? And every decade you go up, you know, the average life expectancy goes up and goes up and goes up and goes up and goes up. So you make it to 10 years old, you're likely to make it another, you know, 50 years on average. And, and, you know, there are childhood diseases. There are ox carts that can roll over you. There are wars, 
right? I mean, like, yeah, you know, there's lots of wars. There's, there's, um, you know, the, the, um, there were raids by, you know, different, you know, uh, you know, uh, Native American nations, things like that. Those, those are still very active. You're out in the frontiers and things like that. You know, life is, life is harsh. Life is dangerous. That says nothing about how long you live until your body just gives up. Right. And there's a lot of smoking back then and, and drinking. So, you know, it's, um, it's, uh, it, you have to sort of, you know, pick through these things and, and spot the bullshit. And, and those are definitely bullshit. You know, there's literally a hundred years of studies showing that the Inuit population as a whole had much lower rates of chronic disease and heart disease, even though they smoke a lot, you know, a lot younger than most people. And, um, it's only, it's only in the two thousands really that, that the Inuit population started eclipsing the Canadian population as far as heart disease is concerned. That's not because they're eating meat. Look at the entire century that we were studying this before that. And it was the opposite. So what changed? I mean, it's just cherry picking, you know, it's, it's, it's complete ridiculous. It's total rubbish. And so, you know, you're only looking at those and you're only looking at the studies that look at Inuit as a population, as opposed to the ones eating meat. So what are you trying to say? You can't glean any information off that. All you can say is the population has higher rates of heart disease. You can't say that meat causes that. In fact, what you can say from that is not eating meat causes that, is that eating other things cause that because when they're eating meat, they don't get that. They have much lower rates, much, much, much lower rates, if not zero, right? And so when they start eating other crap, then they start getting that heart disease rate coming up and now it's even worse. What does that tell you? It tells you that it's better to eat only meat, right? And that you'll have lower diseases of heart diseases. Right. Um, cheesy chunky. I think this is the from the super chat uh, before. So thank you for popping that up. Um, okay. Can carnivore raise your PSA? My husband has been strict carnivore for three months. All numbers are great, but his PSA went from two to five. He's 59 and has no symptoms. Uh, it really shouldn't, you know. I mean, PSA sometimes has been uh, associated. Well, Prostate enlargement has been associated with uh, insulin resistance, actually. So if you're eating just, just meat, salt, and water, you're not getting carbs or artificial sweeteners or anything like that, no, you shouldn't. Uh, it shouldn't be from that anyway. There can be other things that can raise your PSA, but it shouldn't be from a carnivore diet. Um, and um, I would keep an eye on that, obviously. You know, if, um, if there is something going on, um, obviously, you know, cancer and things like that, take decades and decades and decades to, uh, to, to reach a point that your body actually turns into something that, that it doesn't want. But watch my video with professor Thomas Seafried on, uh, cancer and cancer biology. And, uh, and you'll see that, that, um, if that the best thing you can do for prevention as well as, uh, putting your body into a, a very, uh, favorable metabolic position to fight off cancer is by being in ketosis and by just eating fatty meat and, um, you know, some other stuff as well, potentially if you want it, but you know, there are carcinogens and things that are harmful in plants that don't contain carbohydrates as well, which is sort of the point I've been trying to make to the medical uh, community, um, that already knows about the benefits of ketogenic diets and lifestyles and, um, improving metabolic health. And, you know, I made that video, I did that, um, talk at a, at a medical conference in Australia, it was called plants are trying to kill you. I was trying to, I was trying to turn some heads and, uh, and it did, you know, I was pointing out to a group of doctors that were already very interested in, in low carb, um, diets as a, as a lifestyle and, and metabolic health modification. Um, and they, um, and, and I was just arguing, Hey, look, there's more, yes, carbs are bad. Fundamentally derails your metabolism away from what it should be. But there are other things too. There are other things we need to watch out for as well. And I wasn't putting these things relatively anywhere. I was just saying, look, there are other things at play here. So, um, you know, and that, and so I think that, you know, for, you know, for cancer and things like that, I think it's probably best to be just flat out, just meat and water only. I mean, this is what we evolved on, right? So, um, so you know, if he has something brewing, definitely keep an eye on that. Should should be his doctor should be sort of keeping an eye on that, 
And um, but if it if it is something weird that's sort of been building up and is there, uh, I still think that this is the best way to do it. And no, I it's generally the opposite. Like a lot of people will actually um, reduce the size of their prostate by going on a carnivore diet as well. So there could be other things going on, uh, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't be the carnivore diet that shouldn't cause that. No. J-23, thank you very much for the super chat. Hi, doctor. I'm active duty military. Well, thank you very much for your service. I really appreciate that. And I know a lot of people here do as well. Uh, got medically disqualified from uh, the job I wanted for astigmatism, uh, minor uh, keratoconus. Thoughts on carnivore and eye health? Good question. There are people that improve their vision. There are people that improve uh, their eyesight, actually people that don't need glasses anymore, which I think is crazy. Uh, but it's interesting. More and more people are finding that. Maybe someone in the comment, someone you know, watching now, if you've had experience with this, please comment with what type of, of uh, you know, issue you had with your eye. If you had an astigmatism and anyone who had minor uh, keratoconus, you know, did that help you? It's, it's possible. Um, I, I don't know all the different eye conditions that a carnivore diet can help. Although I do know that, that it helps some because they're just, I mean, there's just dozens and dozens of people that I've seen now that have stopped using glasses and their vision has improved, which is crazy. I mean, that's just amazing that, that, that can do that, you know, macular degeneration. I mean, that's, I, I've talked to several ophthalmologists about this, such as, you know, Dr. Chris Kenobi, um, who was saying that you can, you just reverse, um, uh, macular degeneration, you know, with, with ketogenic, you know, carnivore diets, you know, I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing. And that's a, that's a, just a major, major, major problem in ophthalmology. So it, it can and will improve eye health, whether or not it improves your specific conditions to the point that you can see better and be qualified for the job that you want. I don't know. Um, hopefully someone in the chat has, ex ha has had experience with your, particular eye conditions and maybe they can shed some light on whether or not it helped them but it also helped you in so many other ways anyway it's it's definitely worth doing and and if it improves your eyesight great if it doesn't you're going to get a thousand other benefits as well anyway uh it's a question from dylan Britt. um says dr chafee hey doc uh family friend of ours has an eight-year-old daughter she just had a brain tumor removed. They were able to remove all of it, uh, but it ruined her pituitary. Ugh, sorry about that. Any chance a uh, proper human diet could help? Well, it's definitely going to help in a, in, a, in a number of ways, um, certainly with development, with childhood development, um, brain development, body development. And, and yes, it can absolutely help the brain recover um, with brain trauma, traumatic brain injury. I mean, this is sort of a, of a doctor induced traumatic brain injury. Uh, it has been shown that ketogenic diets improve, uh, recovery. There are studies with concussions that show that being in a state of ketosis, when you get a concussion, uh, actually protects your brain from the damage that a concussion can cause. Um, unfortunately, you know, stopping carbs right then, yes, it can help, but you might not be in ketosis and have high enough ketones. Uh, before sort of damage is done from a from a concussion point of view. However, with traumatic brain, brain injury and with surgery, obviously it's a, it's a much longer recovery period. And and I've seen people go on a carnivore diet 30 years after a stroke and and recover. The hell is that about? I mean, that's that's insane. Um, Dave Mack I had a had an interview with him on my channel, and he has his own channel. You guys can check him out. Um, very nice guy and a dramatic recovery. He had a subarachnoid hemorrhage 30 years earlier, um, had weakness down his right side, very unstable, very unbalanced, very difficult for him to get up and down stairs. Uh, had done ketogenic diets, Atkin diets, you know, for several years early on and didn't improve his neurological symptoms. They were stable 30 years later, stable neurology. All of a sudden he goes on carnivore two, three months later, he's walking normally and he can run up and down stairs the hell is that? That's crazy. So it will help her in a lot of ways. Will it return her pituitary to normal function? Really no way to tell, uh, without trying, you know, it's just going to be a trial and error sort of thing. Um, but quite often if you, if you damage destroyer, I had to remove the, the pituitary, if there's just big, 
nasty thing in there and you just that pituitary was just a casualty of war um then you need to take the hormones that the pituitary produce lifelong that's okay it, it actually is okay um you can get pretty much normal function um as long as you take those medications and as long as you keep them at the right level uh it sucks you know it's not nice you know there's going to be a combination of pills and injections for the rest of her life if that's the case if her if her pituitary can't recover but if if anything's going to help it recover it would it would be in my estimation a carnivore diet that's the i've never seen anything work better for neurological uh recovery than a carnivore diet so i can't say that it's going to help her case it really doesn't matter how how far along the damage is um, and if the body can recover at all i think that going on a carnivore diet will put her in the best position to recover if she can and it will also optimize her body um, uh, in, in many, many other ways, especially as she's eight years old. A, she's got a tumor. I don't know if it's cancer, but you know, cancer in general is helped by these sorts of diets uh, in clinical trials in humans. You know, so brain tumors, especially. I don't know what kind of brain tumor she had, um, but there are, you know, there are a number of human trials with like GBM, glioblastoma multiform, um, and that's sort of the worst. Um, primary brain tumor that you can get. It's the most aggressive, most life-threatening. As uh, It's a terminal disease. You, as soon as you get that diagnosis, you are considered terminal. There is not considered any cure. And yet people going on a carnivore diet are still here a decade later. And, uh, and they have no sign of progression of their disease. So can't say that's going to happen with her. But I can say that if I were in that situation, that's what I would do with myself or my kid. And especially for an eight-year-old who has their whole life ahead of them and you only get to develop once, you obviously want perfect nutrition, optimal nutrition for development because then you'll get optimal development. So good luck to them. Good luck to her. Uh, Mark Yost, thank you for the super chat. Not anything attached. We'll see if there's anything uh, down the line. Uh, K-N-N-K-N-N, thank you very much for the super chat. Hi, doctor. I have a deviated septum causing sleep apnea. Can I get rid of deviated septum with a carnivore diet? Lost 56 pounds eating carnivore. Great. That's awesome. Uh, deviated septum is not going to fix itself. That, that would need a surgical intervention. However, a carnivore diet will reduce the inflammation and swelling of the soft tissue inside the nasal cavity and the soft palate. And that can help with snoring. That can help with sleep apnea. Deviated septum but that's the thing, though, that swelling and inflammation and the myosteatosis, the, the fat, you know, in that, because even before people lose the weight, they stop snoring and stop sleep apnea quite often, even within the first week or two. Um, second of all, when that, that fat sort of goes away, um, you know, that, that can shrink things down uh, quite a lot as well. But if you've already lost 56 pounds um, and you've been doing carnivore for a while, or actually, I don't know if you're, you're on carnivore. You're asking if this can help, if carnivore can help. And I'm, you know, yeah, yeah, you did. Sorry, it's 56 pounds eating carnivore. Great. So you've been on carnivore for a while. You've lost a whole bunch of weight. So the inflammation should be gone. The fat in the tissue should be gone. If you're still snoring, you still have sleep apnea, that's the deviated septum. You're going to need to get that surgically um, fixed. Basically, you're going to have to get that straightened out. Uh, carnivore diet won't straighten that. It will only work on the soft tissue, and it can reduce that, but it, it should have done that by now. So if you're still having a problem, you have a physical obstruction, just like me. I've broken my nose. Oh, God, I couldn't even tell you how many hundreds of times because I, I broke the cartilage, I broke the bone, and I just kept playing. I didn't stop. I didn't stop play. I kept playing uh, another six months before I got surgery. I could not breathe out of my nose for six months. And because I never even took a week off to let it sort of harden up, um, actually most practices would get smashed, but every weekend on the game, my nose would get smashed because it's just, it's a very violent game. And I, I, I was a very violent player. And, you know, when your nose starts bleeding and things like that, other players see it, they start smashing it, punching it. Um, they thought that that would, and it hurt like hell. Um, but they thought it would just be like, pain. oh God, oh my poor face. Uh, that was my, that was my kill switch. You know, it was like, you hit my nose, you know, bodies were going to pile up and that was my Hulk switch, you know, like, you know, it was just like, you know, don't make me angry. You wouldn't like me when I was angry. Someone hit me in the nose. 
that happened. And so, you know, that was, that was just the biggest mistake anyone could make uh, on the rugby field because I, I just, I ended up just playing so much harder, so much more aggressively and, uh, and just going for scalps at that point. It was just like people, people had to die. And um, as, uh, as, as bad as that sounds, I just play, I just played very, 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 I never played cheap. I never hit anyone dirty, anything like that. I didn't have to because I could just hit you in a tackle and, and I could hit people hard enough to take them out of the game. So I didn't waste my time with, with cheap hits. Um, not that I would have anyway. Um, but, uh, I could not breathe and I was doing carnivore at the time. I could not breathe for six months. I was a, I was a mouth breather. I breathe at night sleeping. My, I would wake up four times a night and have to drink water because my mouth would get so dry because I could not breathe through my nose. And I talked like this for six months. This is what my voice sounded like. Um, it was awful. Um, you had to get surgery. So I've, I've had surgery you know, a few times trying to straighten that out and breathe better. Um, it's not going to fix itself. Unfortunately, no, uh, even with a carnivore diet, that's only going to fix the soft tissue. But if you have actual deviated hard tissue, like cartilage or bone, that just, that needs to be surgically, surgically, uh, uh, fixed. Okay. So good luck with that. Um, Sam's block. Thank you very much for the super chat. Hey, Anthony, big fan. What's your opinion on plant compounds in products that aren't food like shampoo, deodorant, toothpaste, etc.? I guess this gets into endocrine disruption, dermal absorption. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the thing you need to think about. Are you going to get, if you're eating a whole bunch of stuff, you know, you're getting a lot more in your body, but of course they can soak through and, and through your skin and you can get this, um, endocrine disruption as well. And that's not just from plant compounds, um, but it can be from uh, artificial compounds and these microplastics and other sorts of weird chemicals that we've invented in the last 50 years. I think there's something that's like, there's been over a million different patents on new chemicals in the past 50 years, since the 1970s. None of those things existed. Those things have been been manufactured um, artificially by industry. <clears throat> These are molecules that our body has never come across. Um, the odds of them being good for you, and especially designed to be good for you, like medications, but they're only going to be good for you in certain contexts, um, is very low. It's very, very low. You know, our body's used to you know, to and adapted to dealing with certain molecules. And this is why these things are called these forever chemicals, because your body doesn't know what the hell to do with them. They don't exist in nature. And so your body has no ability or enzyme or capacity to eliminate these things, right? And so, um, you know, this is like trans fats. Trans fats don't exist in nature, right? And so our body doesn't know how to deal with them. So they just get stuffed in all these different crevices and and, and cause atherosclerosis and a lot of heart disease. Cooking with seed oils causes trans fats. So something to think about there. But um, so trans fats, you can consider that sort of a, a forever chemical because our body doesn't know what the hell to do with it. And so it just builds up in the body. And so, yeah, you need to be, you need to be aware of that. It's not just plant products though, but like the essential oils and the different uh, scents and the lavender scents and the tea tree scents. And there's, there's, again, there's always mixed uh, views on this in the literature, but there are studies looking at this and showing that this can cause endocrine disruption and, and block testosterone and, and upregulate uh, estrogen, even in, in, pubescent boys and interrupt puberty in uh, teenage boys. So, you know, is, is this something that you want to do? You know what? I'm again, these studies only help sort of guide us, right? But at the end of the day, it's your body, right? So for me, is it worth the risk? Not really. Is it going to have this sort of nice smelling soap? I just really couldn't care less. This is why I use tallow soap. I use tallow. I use just just straight up unscented tallow soap to wash my my body, face, and hair. You know, and so um, you know that that's why I sort of you know I partnered with um, with uh, my friend Asher. I've done a podcast with, um, and he has this company. Um, um, oh Jesus Christ! I'm I'm completely blank with this, but uh, Stone and Spear. So. You know that's that's what um, what they do. They just make tallow products, and um, and uh, they have things that have some you know very minor sort of 
scents and things like that. If you want, I don't, I get the ones without any sort of scents or anything like that. And so, you know, that, that's what I use. So, uh, yeah, so that's stone and spear tallow, sorry. And, um, and so I avoid that stuff. Um, there are a lot of people like Dr. Jamie Seaman, um, who goes by Dr. Fit and Fabulous, who's fantastic. You know, if, if people haven't seen her stuff, you should definitely go and look at all her stuff. She just had a recent TED talk, um, you know, talking about sort of women's health issues, which is fantastic. I would encourage everyone to find that and watch that. And, um, but she talks about this as well. And a lot of other people do also, um, you know, Dr. Sarah Saldivar would talk about these sorts of things as well. Um, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, and, you know, and a lot of other people, right? So, it's, uh, it is something that I think is important. I think it is definitely a factor. Um, and so I just try to keep things as clean and, 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 um, as basic as possible. And, you know, and that, and that, that works for me anyway, and it, and it at least eliminates out the possibility. You're just stopping the exposure to potentially harmful things. Maybe they're not, maybe they're not as bad as they're cracked up to, uh, as people are making them out to be maybe, but you know what? Um, they are, there's a potential there. And so, you know, why mess around? You know, there's, you know, if you don't need it, then, you know, it's, you're not really losing anything by, by cutting it out. So that's, that's sort of my philosophy on that. Michael Jackson back from the dead. Thank you so much for the super chat. Uh, just a donation. You do great work. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. And thank you for watching. That's uh, it's great to have you here. Frankie 24 K. Thank you very much for the super chat. Um, six months on carnivore down 75 pounds. Great job. That's awesome. I now I'm now having pain in my back on the right side, underarm, I believe gallbladder area. Um, could that be kidney stone or, or bile sludge? So, well, if it's in your back, less likely to be the gallbladder. Gallbladder is on the front. So you have sort of in the right upper quadrant of your abdomen. And that's if you eat fat, then you should get a uh, squeeze pain because that's squeezing and maybe squeezing on, on um, you know, stones or something like that, right? Um, you've been doing this for six months. So if you had stones formed in there, probably would have cleared out by now. Uh, you don't get gallstones from eating fat. In fact, you get gallstones from not eating fat because gall, your bile, your liver makes bile stored in your gallbladder and it sits there and it concentrates up to 20 times more concentrated in the literature, in the physiology textbooks. It can concentrate up to 20 times more. Maybe some people concentrate even more than that. Maybe those are the ones are at increased risk of getting um, gallbladder disease and stones. What happens to any hyper-concentrated solution at rest? forms crystals, precipitates. That's what bile sludge is. That's what gallstones are. And so if you are not eating enough fat or you're not eating any fat, which is mostly what the people that get gallstones are, that I've, I've eaten no fat in the last three months. I can't possibly have gallstones because you're told that not eating, that eating fat causes it. Um, dead, dead wrong. It's exactly the opposite. So I look at them and say, well, actually, that's why you got gallstones because now you have this, this, you know, bile is sitting there and getting concentrated and concentrated and concentrated and it just solidifies, right? If you were eating fatty meat, if you're eating fatty food, you would release that bile, bile, right? And so if you're eating enough every day, it's physically impossible to form stones because it, it takes much longer than one day to form gallstones. And so if you're clearing out the bile every single day, you're never going to have enough uh, time to form uh, gallstones, right? So it's not that you ate fat, it's because you didn't eat fat. Now you're eating fat. As long as you're eating a high fat carnivore diet, if you're eating lean carnivore diet, okay, well, maybe if you're not eating enough and it's building up. Um, so I would just stick to high fat, but the area you're sort of describing in your back, back here, that's more of the, the kidney area, right? Sort of the renal area. Um, and so I wouldn't think that's as much with the, the bile or the gallstones. Um, but yeah, like kidney stones or something like that. I wouldn't think it would be bile sludge just given that you've been on carnivore for six months, probably eating a decent amount of fat. Uh, and that's not really the area for, for gallstones. Gallstones would be in the front, in the back. That can be other things. If it's sort of in the middle of the back or sort of in the upper abdomen and radiating to the back, you know, that can be something else entirely. So it really matters about the specifics, but sort of on the back is, uh, in that area that you're describing, would 
would more likely be something to do with the kidney. So you can talk to your doctor. Um, kidney stones will show up. You'll have blood in your urine. And um, even if it's just sort of trace amounts, and then you can sort of get a scan and see what's going on there. Um, you can still get um, kidney stones. People have been known to get kidney stones from oxalate dumping. Um, and there's still the calcium oxalate stones. Um, there are um, you know, some suggestions that eating too much organ meat can can uh, increase risk of um, kidney stones as well. Um, but just take a look. You know, I mean, you, you need to you need to find out. I mean, if you're drinking enough water and you're just eating a meat only diet, um, that's that's going to prevent a lot of things and and seriously improve your kidney function and health. But uh, at the same time, you can have oxalate dumping, you have other sorts of things in your system as well that can sort of kick off uh, kidney stones and get infections that can actually cause uh, staghorn calculi, which are big, massive suckers. Um, so, you know, it's worth checking out. Um, I would think it'd be more something to do with your kidney. So, so have, have a chat with your doctor and, you know, pee in a cup and look at, see if there's blood in it. If you certainly, if, you, if you're getting a sort of a rosé tint to your urine, then, then you need to get checked out. And, you know, that's that's likely to be something uh, something causing a bleed like kidney stones or something like that. So, uh, yeah, just I would, I would talk to your doctor about that. Uh, so that was Frank. I'm just going to take a look and see how many questions we have left. I think we've got a number of, uh, I think we've got enough questions to get us through um, the next sort of 15 minutes, which is about the time that I have. So um, why don't we just basically uh, uh, don't, please don't put any more uh, super chats just because I, I don't want to not be able to get to them. And I, and I do have to get to work. So I don't want to keep them waiting either. Okay. A uh, question from Joseph. Thank you very much. That's very generous of you. Um, been on strict carnivore for almost three months. Also been working out uh, for 60 minutes, three times per week. I uh, usually work out on an empty stomach because I eat late afternoon, early evening. Should I be taking a supplement to help muscle growth and retention? Uh, generally not. I, I've never found it easier to put on muscle than when on a carnivore diet, just eating carnivore. Um, if you're eating enough, right? So you need to eat enough. So you need to get enough fatty meat. Uh, it sounds like you're eating, you know, in the afternoon, evening, which is great. Um, that's what I do. I feel best when I do that and always work out on an empty stomach. I always feel I get better workouts. It depends on what kind of workouts, you know, if you're just doing a whole bunch of cardio, that's not really going to stimulate, you know, muscle growth and, and, um, in, in the same way that like sprinting and weightlifting will, um, I, it's sort of, I get the impression they're probably doing weightlifting. Um, but, uh, but yeah, just general in general people, uh, cardio, not really the best thing to do that can actually, uh, lower testosterone, lower growth hormone, uh, raise cortisol and, uh, and can actually put on visceral fat and, uh, and you know, it doesn't, it, it sort of can tone, but it's not going to, it's not going to, uh, build up muscle. And so sprinting, weightlifting, that will improve your hormones. In men, it will improve testosterone and growth hormone. And women will improve growth hormone and lower cortisol for both. And, uh, and it will get rid of visceral fat for both, which is very, very important. That's a very important biomarker that my friend, Dr. Sean O'Mara, has been highlighting over the past couple of years, which is very important. It's, it's probably one of the most important biomarkers that we can look at. If you get an abdominal MRI and you see how much fat is around the organs, um, that is a very good marker of overall health because that fat is metabolically active. It can actually increase your risk of getting cancer and dying from cancer and, and a lot of other metabolic issues as well. So, and there, and there's actually like evidence for why that is. So, um, that I talk about in other videos. So it's very important. It's a very important biomarker, lifting weight, sprinting, carnivore diet. Those are the best things to do to get rid of your visceral fat and improve your metabolic health. Um, if you want to put on muscle, you have to eat enough. So you have to stimulate your body. You have to lift weights and sprint. And then you have to make sure your body's getting enough. So if you're eating enough fatty meat, you're eating until it stops tasting good. And you're trying that twice a day. If you're working out a lot like you are, then, then that should be fine. And you, you'll find that you put on muscle very, very, very easily. And, um, uh, I you generally don't need supplements. You know, people, people like taking creatine tons of creatine and red meat. So if you're eating predominantly red meat, that should be fine. Um, uh, Vince uh, Garanda, who's, a, who's the, called like the iron guru. He was uh, one of the golden arrow bodybuilders. People can look him up even in you know, his 50s and 60s. The guy was jacked. Um, in his 80s, the guy was jacked. Um, 
he ate basically a carnivore diet. And he thought that you needed to eat carbohydrates to replenish your liver glycogen. That was incorrect. That was the thinking of the time. That's not true though. Uh, you, you replenish all your glycogen and blood sugar just by, just by being in ketosis, your body does that for you. So he would eat carnivore six days a week. And then one day he, he carb up because that's how he thought would get your glycogen. So he was just unfortunately misinformed on that. But, but that was, that was what we thought back then, but it's not, but we know, we know differently now. Um, and, uh, and he was saying that you're know, eating like 36 eggs a day, you know, that was, that was, uh, that could give similar responses to, um, the, like a, a low, low, um, dose cycle of steroids, right? So there's, there's like some serious, <laughs> serious, uh, muscle building potential there with just, just the food that you're eating. And so just keep eating what you're eating, eat until fatty meat stops tasting good and work out and, and you'll do great. And, um, you know, I mean, if, if you were to check your bloods and your hormones and things like that, you, you would probably find that they're great. And, you know, if you checked it before and three months, six months, a year after doing carnivore, I think you'd find that they improve dramatically. Your growth hormone would go up, your testosterone would be going up and, and, uh, and everything else would be optimizing as well. If you have a specific deficiency somewhere, Sure, address it if you're not getting enough B12 or folate because you're you're not methylating them properly, um, you know because of some sort of genetic issue. Adding in a bit of liver that generally is the supplement for carnivores is just adding a bit more organs. You know, if you want more nutrients, just have a bit more organs. They're extraordinarily nutrient dense, but again, that's the problem. It can be too dense and it can cause a problem. So just make sure that you're you're not getting too much. But you know, if you're not getting enough. They, they are there for you. So no, I don't think you need to add anything else. I don't, I don't take creatine. I don't, you know, I certainly don't take steroids. And so, and I've found that I've never put on uh, muscle easier to more on carnivore diet. And, and just, I mean, that's, that's what everyone's reporting is that, you know, people are in their seventies, you know, are stacking on muscle and they're like, this is crazy. How does that work? You have to put in the work, what you're doing. Um, but you also have to, you know, and, and, and if you do put in the work, and you eat enough, you'll you'll put you'll put on muscle very very easily. Uh, Temadola, thank you very much for the super chat. I'm about six weeks into carnivore, have leaky gut, and have to tuck the end of my anus back in when I use the toilet. Uh, still with skin issues and anus inflammation, so that that's going to probably be there for a while. You know, if you have prolapsed anus, um, you have a prolap pro prolapsed rectum. Um, you know, I, I can't say that that's going to fix itself. I mean, that's a structural issue that, that may need surgery. It may be that, uh, this has helped because the body can, you know, sort of heal a lot of, a lot of things. I don't know if it can heal that. I, I haven't seen that issue, uh, as of yet, maybe you can, you know, let us know how you go in the next sort of six months to a year to see if that's improved. Uh, one thing that it, it, it can help with just logistically is that by eating a carnivore diet, you're not going to need to go to, you know, defecate as often. So you're going to have much lower volume and much less often. So hopefully that will help that situation. You need enough fat. So if you're eating, if you're not eating enough fat, you're going to get dry, hard, rocky stools. And that will obviously, um, not be helpful in this situation. So eat enough fat so that stools are very soft. And if they're not soft, eat more fat. That by definition, if your stools are hard, you're not eating enough fat. More fat will make it softer. So um, I would do that. Also, you can actually go back to the original, you know, uh, uh, Salisbury's diet, you know, the original sort of carnivore diet back in the 1800s with Dr. Salisbury, who made the Salisbury steak where they ground meat without the gristle. So basically take the gristle out. I mean, it may not be possible for you to grind your own meat and take the gristle out. But, you know, that, that sort of that connected tissue, that, that tough sort of chewy stuff, usually between the fat and the meat, that, that's the gristle. If you take that out, if you sort of cut that out and just eat the soft muscle meat and the soft fat and maybe add some butter to that, you will, you will absorb nearly 100% of that. And you will not need to defecate much at all, right? And as long as you're getting enough fat, it'll still be soft. So 
That's what Dr. Salisbury did in the 1800s to rest people's gut and bowels when they had like severe Crohn's and ulcerative colitis and things like that because they had serious, serious, serious gut issues from eating all these bloody plants and and um, and we had no medications that could help them. And so that was it. You had to really rest the bowel and uh, and that's how you do it. So if you get rid of the gristle and all that sort of stuff, you'll go much, much, much less often. Uh, leaky gut will, will heal itself as well. Takes like six months to a year though. But the good thing about eating a carnivore diet, even when you have leaky gut, you're not bringing in things that are going to get through there and cause a problem, like all these different lectins and plant toxins. So I would be very strict. I'd be only red meat and water if you can do it. Any meat's fine, um, but red meat is best. And try to take out the gristle. Try to eat a lot of fat, and um, and you'll minimize the amount that you have to defecate. And hopefully that that helps with that issue as well. But yeah, you may need surgery for that. So, um, but you know, it may, it may this could potentially help it become more manageable. And the skin issues as well. A lot of skin issues uh, benefit, but again, it depends on the the type of skin issues and what's causing them as well. Uh, Holly Ruth, thank you very much for the super chat. Upping the fat, I'm not exactly craving uh, just sport of meat. Uh, carnivore over six months, uh, paring down to lion diet for rheumatoid arthritis. Seven days of water, beef, and lamb. Any suggestions? Well, look, I think I think you're doing great, and I think it's a great idea to do a lion diet for rheumatoid arthritis. Anybody with autoimmune issues really should be just sticking to red meat and water. And uh, and and yeah, you know the thing is, is that lean meat can get very boring very quickly. And um, as as chefs will tell you, fat is flavor, and so you add in the fat, and it becomes much more interesting. But if meat doesn't taste good, you're not hungry. If lean meat doesn't taste good, it might be that you're not getting enough fat. So eat fatty meat, eat fattier meat, add butter to it. If that helps, great. Keep eating it until it doesn't taste good anymore. If you start doing that and you just go, Ugh, I don't really want to do this, you're not hungry. It's fine uh, as long as there's enough fat there and um, your, your body has will your body knows when it gets enough nutrients as long as you're not eating carbohydrates and lectins and other sort of plant toxins that can derange and disrupt your body's signals and and absorption and digestion so i would i would just do exactly that i would stick with red meat and water i would increase the fat and i would not eat if meat doesn't taste good it should always taste good it should always be fun steak should always be awesome and sometimes people get just just you know they just get bored, you know, because they're so used to eating all these other sorts of things. You know, I don't look at it that way. I mean, I look at these other things. I don't even look at them as food because they're not. They're not food to us. You know, food is species specific. And so, you know, a zebra doesn't look at what a giraffe eats and goes like, oh, God, I wish. No, they just say like, no, thank you. Um, that's not food to a zebra. And so, um, and vice versa, you know, giraffes don't want what, what zebras are, are picking up, right? So, you know, it's, um, we get used to this and we just get, you're sort of eating for pleasure and eating for entertainment. And, and so, we, you know, we need to get away from that. You know, food is, food is about nutrition and food is about health. And so we can, we can still enjoy it. You know, we get that, we get that positive response because, you know, we need some sort of biological signal that, that tells our body, yes, that's good. Obviously, sugar is a bit of an outlier, but sugar is known to be something that's that's technically safe. It doesn't kill you in a day because there aren't things with fructose in it naturally that that are directly toxic to you. Well, now we've, you know, but they were only available for a couple of weeks once a year, and so and you know you sort of eat those things. They're mildly sweet. You recognize them as safe. Oftentimes, people didn't eat them. You know, the the Native Americans. People would say, oh, they ate pemmican. Most of the year, they would eat pemmican. They'd eat bison. They'd eat pemmican from the bison, which is dried meat and fat. It was, oh, well, they put berries in it. They put on bullshit. That's what they sold to the Europeans because the Europeans wanted something sweet. They wanted something else. And so we're like, okay, idiots, here's some, put some berries in it. Uh, it's cheaper anyway because you know the meat is more of the commodity. And, um, and that's what all these other sort of plant fillers are and all the different processed foods that, that we buy. Um so it, it wasn't the Inuit who act, or the 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 uh, Plains Indians who ate the berries. They they just ate the meat, and um, but you know so we recognize that as safe, and that's why fructose is is very sweet to us. But it was only available very rarely. We weren't shipping in mangoes from the equator. Um, it's just we didn't have the capability of doing that for the, most of the existence of humanity. So. Um, 
you know, just eat fatty meat until it stops tasting good and, and think about these things in natural context. And, and, you know, if you want to switch up the meat that you're eating, you know, different sorts of ways of making them, different sorts of ways of, of, of doing it, you know, that might be a bit more interesting, but always just remember that yeah, food, it tastes good, but it, it's not, its purpose is not entertainment. Its purpose is to give you sustenance. So try to find other things that are entertaining. I, I love the fact that I only eat once a day and I've got an extra six hours of my day that I'm not thinking about preparing or eating food, right? I just do things. I do things like this. I've got times for this. I've got time to go out in the sun. I've got time to, to work a lot more. That's basically what I use my time for is to just work constantly. But, you know, I have time for that. You know, I get a lot more done and it's, and so I entertain myself, you know, with life and I don't need to entertain myself with food. So I, I much prefer that and, and you'll be healthier for doing that. And so I think you're doing exactly the right thing, you know, just eat, especially for rheumatoid arthritis, you know, just eat fatty meat and keep eating it till it stops tasting good and enjoy your life. Enjoy your rheumatoid arthritis free life. Donna K, thank you very much for the super chat. Um, I recently started following you. Well, thank you very much for that. Trying to get my husband on board. Curious if anyone has improved their enlarged prostate with going carnivore. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, like my friend uh, Dr. Sean Amaro, who I was just talking about, he, I mean, he did that himself. Um, and uh, uh, Professor Ben Bickman from BYU, who is really one of the world's experts on insulin and metabolic issues is a biochemist and, and a professor of, of the same at BYU. And he does research specifically on insulin and metabolism. And and that's and he, he's written a book called Why We Get Sick. And if I'm not mistaken, he talks about um, enlarged prostates being uh, sensitive to insulin. And so you get insulin resistance and you get high insulin levels from eating a lot of carbohydrates and um and you get enlargement of your prostate so yes it it, it can and has helped uh people with enlarged prostate obviously there's other things that, that play a role but uh, yes it can absolutely help crazy k thank you for the super chat can carnivore cure sleep apnea and afib it has certainly well it depends on what's ca causing the, this both it can certainly um it can certainly uh it certainly has fixed sleep apnea for many, many people. Uh, my friend Carrie Mann uh, is, is, um, has you know, gone carnivore this year, and he has a, a, a channel called Homestead How, and he absolutely fixed his, um, his um, uh, sleep apnea with, um, with a carnivore diet. And um, I'm just looking at my, at my computer here. For some reason, my, my cable charger isn't working too well. So if my, <laughs> my computer dies, uh, that's what happened. Um, but yeah, so he cured his sleep apnea within a week. Uh, so it can definitely remove the inflammation. AFib, there can be other sorts of things. I have seen isolated uh, reports of people improving that. Generally, um, I would be skeptical, but it's, um, uh, you know, potential sleep apnea can definitely help. If you have deviated septum, you know, that's not going to help that that might need surgery, but it can certainly help with the soft tissue. Absolutely. And it will help you in a lot of other ways as well. Um, Thomas C, thank you so much for the super chat. How about carnivore and adrenal hormones? Yeah, well, look, it, it can improve all of those things. It can reduce stress, reduce cortisol, lower your cortisol, raise growth hormone, raise testosterone, uh, raise estrogen. It depends if you're a man, it's going to improve. It's going to optimize your testosterone, estrogen, progesterone. For women, it's going to do the same thing for a woman. And um, adrenal hormones, every single hormone out of your adrenals, like cortisol, um, are made from cholesterol. And you're taking plants, you're eating plants, they have plant sterols, and that stops your body from using that. They, they can't be used as um, cholesterol. It can't make hormones properly, can't make vitamin D properly. So it messes it up. So yeah, absolutely. Carnivore can help your adrenal hormones and balance your hormones in general. Low carb, low drama. Thank you so much for the very generous super chat. That's very kind of you. I believe in low zero carb health uh, with low insulin and stress. RCTs are hailed as gold standard by keto carnivore community, but two RCTs suggesting keto raises cortisol get rubbish. Your thoughts. Really appreciate your work. Um, I don't know those studies that they're they're talking about, but um, it depends on how the, the studies are put together, obviously, how many people uh, are in it, how long they followed it. I do know that there are studies 
um, looking at people in ketosis for over two years, and they show they don't raise cortisol. Um, and um, and the thing is, too, is that you, you have to sort of wonder why they're raising cortisol as well. Something that was put forward by, I believe, Amber O'Hearn, if I'm not mistaken, is that if you are on a carnivore diet or a ketogenic diet, um, this can improve metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is known to lower cortisol. So people have lower cortisol. A lot of people have metabolic syndrome. 93% of Americans have at least one metabolic disease, right? So metabolic syndrome is, is much more common than it should be. And so if you are, if you're metabolically unwell, your cortisol is going to be too low. And then this actually just sort of readjusts and gets into actual normal levels. So that's, that's the suggestion for that. Is it too high? Is it causing, um, problems with, you know, from hypercortisolism? Uh, no, I don't think that it is. There's a, there, there are, we actually use ketogenic diets when people have hypercortisolism for surgical or medical reasons to ameliorate the symptoms of hypercortisolism, too much cortisol causing damage to the body. So we actually use that as, as an adjunct to medical and surgical treatment to ameliorate the symptoms and problems of um, hypercortisolism, you know, while we are going towards this, a definitive surgical or med medical uh, um, you know, treatment for, for that hypercortisolism. And then it's continued after that in, in many cases as well. It's not everyone, not all the time. It is in the literature, right? Um, so I did a, a video with my friend, uh, Richard Smith, um, just called is ketosis bad for you. We go through a lot of that literature because that's something that, that, uh, you know, Dr. Mercola and, um, Georgie Dinkoff have been sort of making the rounds is sort of the repeat sort of idea that this is a problem. I don't think that that stands on the literature. And so we went through that. Um, I even did a debate with, uh, Georgie Dinkoff, who's this really nice guy. It was, it was actually, it was what a debate is supposed to be. You know, we disagreed and we talked about it. And, um, but it was, it was actually uh, a very, you know, he's a very reasonable person. He's, he's quite bright and very knowledgeable about it. I, I disagree with his conclusions. I think there's, there's other, um, evidence out there. And, and certainly in my own experience, my, my, you know, I don't have raised cortisol or hypercortisolism. I've been doing carnivore with zero carb for six years. And, you know, the Inuit's been doing this forever and people we've been doing this for, you know, 2 million years. So I don't, I don't see that being a problem. If you have to have carbohydrate, first of all, there is no such thing as a, as, a, as an essential carbohydrate. There are entire civilizations that never eat carbohydrates outside of like the glycogen that they'd be getting from muscle meat and organs and no problems, right? So even if you say, well, but that glycogen is really important, fine. You get, you still get everything you need from eating meat. You don't need to add in plant carbs and sugar. Um, so watch that, watch that video that I did on, you know, is ketosis harmful? Um, you can watch the, the debate I did with, uh, Mr. Georgie Dinkoff and, and see what you think. You know, uh, I, I'm all, certainly on the camp of, you know, being in ketosis, you, you're going to go in and out of ketosis anyway, right? I don't care if I'm in ketosis. That's not what I'm worried about. I'm worried. I'm at a baseline level. Am I eating what I'm supposed to eat? Am I eating what's biologically appropriate for my species? Yes, I am. Okay. I'm not worried about anything else. Um, so a quick question from Alvin Kim. Can you eat eggs only? People have, and they do just fine. So, uh, yeah, it should be fine. If you wanted to just eat eggs, um, I would, I would just get pasture raised eggs. So, you know, because those are, I mean, they have 20 times the amount of folate, you know, in pasture raised eggs than, than, uh, normal factory eggs because they're feeding chickens crap. They're feeding chickens, the things that they're not supposed to eat. Anyway, they need to be eating what they're supposed to eat. And they're going to be much more nutritious. Uh, but yeah, you can, and, and there are case reports of people doing that and, um, and so literally just eating eggs their whole life, you know? So, um, yeah, you can just eat only eggs as long as they're sort of pasture raised eggs. And, um, you know, keep an eye out for any sort of nutritional deficiency or anything like that. Um, but you know, it's really just going to depend on the egg really, but yeah, no, you should be fine. Should, uh, uh if you're eating pasture raised eggs, it should be fine. I think meat's better. I think red meat's better, but that's, that's, that should be fine. Okay. All right. This will be, this will be the last question. Uh, every, ooh, is it? Oh, God. okay. Um, yeah. Um, Oh, sorry. That's just from low carb, low drug. Just to know, well, thank you for the super chat. And thank you so much. And she's just saying, thank you. Or they are saying, uh, thank you so much, uh, for the, for the answer. You're very welcome. And uh, I hope that's helpful. And then just the last question of, of the day, um, until next week from Damian Williams. Thank you so much for the super chat. 
Hello, started keto two years ago, eating a huge punch bowl of mixed salad daily. Uh, now carnivore for the last year. Had a bowl of salad for Thanksgiving. It was a bowl of bitterness. Blah. Yeah. Yeah. That's um, it. That bitterness is, is a warning. Your body's telling you don't eat this. Spit it out. Um, and as we have to put dressing and seasonings and all this sort of stuff over it because it doesn't. It just doesn't taste good. And that bad taste is your body warning you against something harmful. Now, does that mean that everything that tastes good is necessarily good for you? No, but it does mean that if it tastes bad, you should probably avoid it. If a two-year-old doesn't want to eat it, I probably wouldn't eat it. Um, well, or you know, a, a six-month-old or a year-old that is just starting to eat solid foods, they're much more in tune to their genetics and biology than we are, just instinctually. And so, if they put a piece of broccoli in their mouth and go, "Oh God." I wouldn't eat broccoli. Um, and uh, I think it is exactly that simple. Now those kids are, you know, can be mesmerized by sugar. But again, that's that, first of all, it's a drug and drugs are addictive. That's, you know, give, give them cocaine too. He's probably gonna like that as well. Um, but it, you know, if it, if it tastes bad, if they just go, oh, I don't want this, then, you know, that's a good sign that there's something in there that's bad for you. So. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, uh, for coming on today. I really appreciate it. I we did go a bit uh, a bit longer than than um, I intended to, but um, there were a lot of very good questions. So I just wanted to make sure I got them all. Thank you all. I will see you again uh, next week, and we'll do the same thing. Great. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you later. Oh, and um, yeah. Also, I have a premiere coming on uh, this Sunday in America, Monday morning in uh, Australia, middle of the, the night for uh, people in Europe. But um, you know, please do make those. It's great when we get a lot of people there. I'll be chatting live with everyone there as well. And um, and and you know answering you know questions if I can if people have questions about the video that we're watching and the interview that we're doing and um, and it's just you know it's sort of nice to get everyone there talking and it also helps the algorithm the more people come out there the more people show interest and comment and like and everything like that you know the more it tells YouTube that this is something worth showing to other people and it, it just helps get the message out so I appreciate it um, everyone who's able to come to that as well all right thank you very much everyone we'll see you next time.